All right, welcome to the March 18th, uh, 2024 non-credits working group meeting. Um, possible status updates, look like the folks aren't on there. I know there's a bit of scrambling going on in the uh, PacPy project and wrap up being done in the Credo Bifold project for getting w, uh, a non-creds in W3C VCDM format. Um, talk about the revocation manager and the design for it. Uh, we did some work on that this week, so I wanted to play with it. Um, wanted to talk about um, how we can implement schema objects for complex JSON objects without getting too complicated, as was done with an OnCreds V1 and rich schema. See if we can um, support complex JSON objects, um, but do it in a reasonably effective way. So I got some ideas there and we'll see how that goes. Um, reminder, this is a Linux Foundation Hyperledger Foundation meeting. So the Linux Foundation antitrust policy is in effect, as is the Hyperledger Code of Conduct. Um, preliminaries, welcome to all. Uh, don't know if anyone wants to introduce, but um, welcome to step up to the mic now. Uh, suggest any topics they want to talk about or any other um, things they want folks to know. All right. Um, announcements IIW is coming up. And um, as well, um, there's a workshop on uh, Wednesday, April 24th that um, Hyperledger and I believe Open Wallet are putting on related to zero knowledge proofs. CK programming in blockchain application development. All right, any other announcements? Okay, jump right into it. Um, as far as status updates go on these, as I say, um, an on credits in W3C VCDM format is close to completion. We've just got a little bit of uh, time left um credo released the 050 um release which was a big uh, accomplishment for that team and that included the uh, w3c for vc support oh. otter pilot is requesting to record this meeting should we allow it uh sure um Second, uh, the, so the Credo 050 is being allowed uh, or being completed. And as a result, that enables um, a, a use of Bifold for that uh, or access to that from Bifold. So that's going to allow for the um, inclusion of um, an on credits in W3C VCDM support to be added to Bifold. So that work is in progress by Animo and then Akapai progress, a um, few stumbling blocks, but I think they're close to having it, uh, the What's Cooking team for adding this support to Akapai. So that's in progress as well. All right. Um, Alisar, um, Alisar Anonkra's revocation manager. So um, we recently added a project, which is right here for um, a, a uh, Hyperledger mentorship program um, mentee to take on, which is adding a revocation manager component. So this describes the project. Um, in doing that, um, we did a bunch of um, playing around with, um, with uh, um, Alasaur's revocation manager, and so came up with a bit of a design. So I wanted to go over that and um, cover what it, uh, what the design should be like, and how we might um, create it, what it's going to involve. So that's what that is. Uh, sorry, Credo Mike is um, what used to be called Aries Framework JavaScript. They renamed it, they moved it to uh, um, Open Wallet and renamed it. So it's now Credo. 
All right, Revocation Manager, um, Alasor, that's the link to Alasor. Alasor is the revocation scheme that is implemented right now in um, an OnCreds V2. Um, as a reminder, it's an accumulator-based zero-knowledge proof revocation scheme for verifiable credentials. And the big thing about it is um, it's much more manageable when scaled than the OnCreds V1. Um, the need for the tails file in an OnCreds V1 limits the size that a, um, a, a revocation registry can be. Practically for mobile wallets, about 3,000 credentials per revocation uh, registry is the limit. So while you can still have unlimited credentials per credential type, um, with Allosaur, you just have one revocation uh, registry for millions of credentials versus having to have hundreds or thousands of revocation registries in an OnCreds V1 and having to manage all of those tails files, have to produce the tails files, publish them, um, and so on. So basic and, and produce updates to the accumulators every time um, credentials are revoked within each uh, registry. So um, the Alasor approach is, is much more manageable from that perspective, um, but it does add a new participant into the mix and that's called the revocation manager. So purpose of this is to go over what the revocation manager is and how it can be configured. What are the various ways um, we wanna configure it? And I'll start with one con uh, configuration and then consider some other approaches that we might use. And so kind of getting feedback. So um, we've got our normal issuer holder verifier and uh, I've put it, calling it the ledger, someplace to publish um, uh, the RevReg, uh, whether that be just a, a file, whether it be a, a ledger, a blockchain, whatever, um, we need a place to put it. So we've got the issuer, um, the holder, the verifier, we've got the ledger, and then we add this new thing called the revocation manager. Um, yes, um, one of the configurations is that the revocation manager and the issuer are just the same thing. And, and that's a collapse of this. And that's basically what I've got here is, um, we've got a single revocation manager. We've got, uh, an issuer. So what happens here, issuer requests creation of a reverage. So there's a create reverage call and, um, the issuer gets back um, the ID for it. I should have included the ID for that, plus the accumulator. And the issuer publishes that accumulator on a ledger as a first, uh, an initial value. Um, issuer issues a VC to the holder. So this is our second step here, our, our third step here, sorry. First step is this, second step is this, third step is an issue. Um, in this case, the verifiable credential is issued plus a the um, revocation registry ID plus the an element is shared with the holder. So that element is a large prime number. I believe that's it. It has certain characteristics, but it's just a big. It doesn't number. have to be a prime number. It could be just a random. It could be anything really. It's a thing. <laughs> yep. But, Whatever but, you want. There's no restrictions on, the, on it. So on the size of it, it's it's just a very it's a it's a number. So it's on the bytes order, not kilobytes, not large. It's it's small. You can make it whatever you want. Yeah. So that goes from the issuer to the holder. Um the whole the issuer obviously creates that and then keeps track of it associated with the holder so that it, and and the credential that it issues so that it knows when it wants to um when it wants to revoke the credential it has to have access to that element um to revoke one or more elements the issuer sends to the revocation manager a list of the elements to be revoked so it could be done on a single one at the time uh, a single one gets revoked or as a batch, say, save up a day's worth and then every once a day send uh, the list of revocations over. Depends on the use case, totally up to the issuer to decide. 
every time they send a list of credentials to be updated, the revocation manager calculates a new accumulator and sends that back to the issuer. Um, at some point, the verifier requests um, from the holder that they want a presentation, and that presentation needs to include a um, a, uh, a proof of non-revocation that the credential the holder is going to present in the in the presentation is not revoked. They might get that accumulator ahead of time. They might go to the ledger and say, "Hey, give me the latest ledger." They might have a ledger cached locally, or they might even leave it up to the holder to go get it from the ledger. That's that's all up to the to the verifier. Um, but the verifier might include with the presentation request an accumulator that they want to get updated. So now the holder, assume we, let's assume that model. So the presentation request comes with the accumulator that the verifier wants to use. Um, the holder then uh, needs to obviously conduct, construct the presentation. And as part of that, they have to get a witness a, an updated witness that is um, relevant to their element and to the accumulator to which they want to prove non-revocation. So they would pass that information to the revocation manager, and they might do it by sharding the element so that they're not sharing the full element with the revocation manager, but rather they're, they're sharding it and sending it in multiple requests to the revocation manager, or even a single request with multiple shards. And then the revocation manager is doing all the calculations once per shard and sending back the witness shards. The, the holder now has the accumulator plus their element plus their witness. With that information, they're able to construct a proof of non-revocation, send that to the verifier, and the verifier can uh, verify the presentation of the credential itself, but they can also verify the accumulator, uh, uh, the, uh, the non-revocation. So, I think that's the overall flow, and that's where the revocation manager fits in. Um, as Mike says, that can be the the revocation manager can be part of the issuer, in which case the holder is communicating back to the issuer directly, or it could be in, in independent of it. it. Could be done as a, a as a service for many issuers, for example. So there's various um, ways we can do that. Um, the data flow, just to remind people of how small the data flow is, we've got an ID. Uh, when the revocation manager creates the reverage, they've got an ID for it, they've got a key pair, and they've got an accumulator. Again, all of those are on the order of a of numbers, <laughs> single numbers for each of these. Um, the issuer publishes the reverage and ID, the public key for the revocation and the accumulator. So again, um, all relatively small pieces of data. During issuer, uh, during issuing, the issuer creates um, a new revocation element per credential. And I can take out the word prime and just say a big number um, per VC. Um, the issuer sends the element. This is the largest um, data transfer that occurs, <laughs> depending on how many credentials are being revoked. If you're obviously revoking hundreds or thousands of credentials at once, you're sending hundreds or thousands of elements to the revocation manager. So that is the one place things can get um, large, but these are never mobile elements uh, or, or <laughs> not expected to be mobile elements. So easily done. And um, the issuer gets back a accumulator uh, which again is a small number. Um, the accumulator and the public uh, gets updated on the ledger, again, uh, uh, on the order of a number. And finally, the holder gets an updated witness from the re uh, revocation manager for their element. And again, this might be done in shards, so you might have a handful of them. Um, but, uh, it, you know, it doesn't... It, 
it, it, again, is not a large amount of data. So really the only place you have a large, a potential large amount of data is if you're revoking a very large percentage or a large number, whatever size it is, doesn't matter, but a, a very large number of revocations at one time. So if you were to revoke every credential in the in the um, in a that have been issued, you would have a large transfer. But that's the only time and the only places you have large amounts of data being transferred. All right. Um, so the challenges and solutions to this, um, the holder is sharing a unique identifier for themselves, for themselves. Let's go with that. Um, they, uh, so they're sending a unique identifier to the revocation manager for themselves. Um, sharding the element is one option. Um, and then calling the revocation manager for each shard, which, and then uh, assembling the resulting witness back. So the shards are unique per invocation, so they don't share a repeated uh, set of identifiers. Every time they do this, they get a new set of identifiers that are sharded and shared. The other thing that could be done is the holder could um, share shards to a verifier, for example, and get that updated. So that's another option, but but ultimately they are sharing their element in some way um, with a party in order to get the witness. And so sharding, it seems like the best way to do it. Um, here's a few, actually I had this set up to be separate models, but anyway, um, a, sep a couple of deployment options. So one is you have the issuer and the revocation manager as the same thing. So that this is one item um, <clears throat> all within the same family, if you will, all, all running within the same, um, behind the same firewall, for example, and um, you're back to the issuer holder verifier scenario and everything is handled by the issuer with the downside here is the holder is having to call back to the issuer clearly call back to the issuer to um, get its updates um, it can do that via the sharding or via um, some other party in order to off obfuscate that it's the holder but but ultimately they're calling back to the revocation manager um Another way to do this is um, a revocation service where you actually have multiple revocation managers. Now, Mike, check me on this. If you have multiple revocation managers, they must share the same keys, right? They've got to share the private key amongst them. Yeah. Yeah. It's like threshold MPC based at that point. Yeah. yeah. So, so what you're doing here is the holder can send it to any of the entry points to this revocation service. So each of these... You know, if it's got three in this case, or I've got N here, one, two, and N. Uh, so it could have N revocation managers, um, each with their own endpoint. The holder could send it uh, to any of the, the shards, to any of them, um, and get back those. And then with this issuer service, um, note I've got one issuer, but I'm also saying other issuers could use this service. So, um, not clear exactly how the, the funding model would work, but presumably the revocation service would be charging the issuer. Um, every time you want me to handle a revocation registry, uh, I'll do that for you. Here's where to put it. Um, obviously, that um, accumulator could also be published by this revocation service if you wanted to do it that way, and, and that would save the issuer having to publish that to a ledger. So that's a second model. Um, what have I got for this third one? Why did I have a third one? Um, sorry. It looks I like just a, a smaller diagram of the other one. The smaller diagram, but it's got a difference to it. Um, oh, that's because you're having the verifier do the update versus the holder doing the update. At least that's what it looks like. 
You're basically saying the verifier is just a pass through to update their witness for them. That's what it looks like. See, it's a yeah. get accumulator. Anyway. Yeah. This is down on this line. So the update witness is coming from the holder. Ah, oh, darn it all. Well, the point oh. is it doesn't matter who updates it. Yeah. Or who requests it. So it could be the holder, it could be the issuer, it could be the verifier, it doesn't matter. There's no way for them to identify yeah. which holder is requesting the update. Oh yeah. You know what this is? This is uh, the ledger is eliminated. That's what it is. <laughs> oh. Yeah. So the revocation service. So it was the other one that I, I I mentioned it already, which is just the revocation service is publishing the accumulator itself versus the ledger is is publishing it. So there you go. Sorry about that. Um, but there you go. Um, so you've got a revocation service, same as this one. Um, but instead of the issuer publishing to the ledger, it's just publishing there. So those are all options, correct, Mike? Is that the set of options you see, as you see them? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And the big thing there is, you know, this is essentially serving as an independent party handling the revocation separate from the issuer. And that's the idea of it is that the revocation manager is motivated to not share with the issuer who's getting, who's servicing, who's getting um, updated. So there's no correlation uh, across between the holder and the issuer. The great thing is the revocation manager, the only thing he has to store is the, is the key, the private yeah. key. Yeah. He doesn't have to store any of the elements. He, does, he doesn't even have to store the accumulator. That's all done by the issuer. He's got, hold on, he's got to store the elements that have been revoked, correct? Yeah, he has to store those. That's that's yes. the only thing he has to store besides right. the key. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, so that um, covers that piece of it. So right now, where we stand, obviously, uh, uh, from an implementation point of view is um, – this is all implemented in one chunk of code as part of, uh, as part of an OnCreds v2. So the idea of the um, revocation manager implementation, and in particular, the, the mentorship um, project, is to basically wrap the revocation manager code into a web server that allows for issuer calls um, and holder calls for witness updates. So basically to extract out that um, the part of the revocation manager so that it could be put into a service um, so that these configurations can be implemented. Um, obviously we could do it as we have it now with the revocation manager, but we could also independent, you know, create these as two separate um, services operated by the issuer and and run them but if we ever want to get to this model for sure we want to have these separated out into separate um communicating um uh, services um presumably ideally with um clustering support for um you know op operating on a kubernetes cluster or independently each each node operating on uh, a separate server running um operated potentially by different um parties to enable that support sounds right mike yep yeah the other issue that we've got to work through with it is um using credential status which is the place in a the vcdm the w3c vcdm for um, holding the credential status. Um, we want to have a type for an LSR, um, a status purpose, obviously, um, and uh, a type for the LSR VP as well, so that we can see both the credential status being uh, passed to the holder in the VC, but also in the VP, the um, credential status coming through such that the verifier can verify it. Um, would include the revocation manager URLs, um, the element ID and the revocation key, um, public key, 
Um, or that could be just picked up from the ledger wherever the accumulator is found. Obviously, the, rev the revocation key would probably be put there. Obviously, the element would not be shared in the in on creds. Be, uh, would not be shared in an, in an on-creds VP and would be ignored in a non and on-creds VP. And then finally, um, one of the interesting thing I was coming up with, I don't see it mentioned here, but um, we could have several, oh yeah, it's here. We could have several status purposes. So it's used not only for revocation, but for other purposes. And this is a, a thing that I've never quite understood in the, in the, VC data model, but um, you can have things like suspensions. And so you could use this same mechanism for other types of things other than revocation, where you want a on-off bit per credential and be able to independent, the issuer um, unilaterally send those out. So all of those become possible. Yeah, I mean, the point um, is Allosaur just represents whatever bit you want. Revocation yeah. is the obvious one, but it could be suspended or pending, whatever. It doesn't matter. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, so that's revocation. And what I wanted to cover there. So a reminder, again, we've got that published out as a component. And we've got people already sending emails to me about wanting to know about the project and more. So it looks like we might have um, interest in doing that one. So we're looking forward to that. Um, that's that. Um, Mike, do you want to give an update on the Hyperledger Labs Agora you were talking about? And I'll take some notes on what's uh, going yeah, on. Yeah, so some of the, the cryptography libraries that enable this are being contributed this week to Agora because the audits are now done and those reports will be included in the repo. They're already in the repo. I just need to transfer the repos to Agora. Um, so that that will be done this week. Which are those? Just remind me. Well, I'll, put, I'll put them in the chat. How's that? Awesome. Yeah. Uh, oh, why is it not typing? There we go. Uh, so that's what is going on there. And then... Um, my company's looking to implement these as a third-party service, right? So Lit Protocol is who that yeah. is. Yeah. Um, okay. So there you go. There's those two. Uh, I have another one that will eventually be contributed. I'll put that in here. Um, I'll just mark it as undergoing audit because it is right now. Okay. Okay. But this one will eventually be there too. That's verifiable secret sharing library. That's actually used by both Blissful and Gennaro, but it will also be available um, by, uh, you know, for the updates of uh, Allosaur. So that's undergoing an audit right now. And okay, so, and take a so while. verifiable secret sharing would be what? would be used by the different revocation managers to share mm -hmm. the secrets. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. already being used by Blissful. It's already being used by the Gennaro. <clears throat> so it's kind of semi been audited already, but now it's getting an independent audit again. So, uh, yep. But yeah, so the Allosaur library would, would preferably use this as well. Yeah. Which would be nice, but uh, Blissful is what um, will probably power the Allosaur library because it handles all the signatures, the secret key sharing, and most of the math and heavy stuff. So there's just a few things we have to add to it and revise, but otherwise it should be good to go. Okay. Now, it's not using it today? No, it was. Uh, it's an easy drop-in replacement for what it's currently using. The code that we wrote was like last year uh, or two years ago, <laughs> and it was using something that I was working on independent from Blissful, and then I forked Blissful and updated that. So now I just need to go revamp uh, Allosaur. We can probably put Allosaur in Agora as well. Uh, at least that's the plan. I just okay. need to make sure Sam and 
hard or okay with it. Actually, hard's okay with it. I'm just waiting to hear back from Sam. And then we'll move that over, update it to Blissful and Gennaro. Gennaro is the distributed key gen. So if anybody wants to do it themselves and do a threshold scheme, they can. It's really simple. So if the, oh, I, Dimitri's got a question here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, could, yeah, that's a good it. point. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's status checker. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Credential know. status manager. Yeah. Yeah. The point is each accumulator represents a single status. That's yeah. all. Yeah. So it's whatever. Yeah, it's interesting. The the revocation is such a, a strong use case and, and then they, they throw out this, but it could be used for other things. And it's like, really, are you going to use it for other things? But you're right that it can be and and it's just a it's just a status of a credential so mm -hmm. um I, yep. I was thinking of uh, other use cases so i was wondering maybe it's too uh narrow in a term revocation yeah. but as you said uh, maybe inside this uh status manager or something like that there could be a more a specific name for the revocation status part of it yeah hi Steve and mike thank you very nice i, I have a question about uh, how this is going to change for the for the issuer for the object that the issuer published in the other ledger is going to be is, is i'm going to we're going to to go with the with the revocation registry uh, something like that what kind of object is, is, is going to publish for shack, uh, every time uh, the issuer is going to update the accumulator what kind yeah. of object is going to publish to the ledger uh the, the only thing it's only a 48 byte value it, think of it as like a, a digest uh, SHA-384 digest is, is is basically the same thing. It's not exactly that, but that's close to think of it as that. So you, you could say the ID is the public verification key, which is only 96 bytes. And then the accumulator itself is a 48 byte value. That's the only thing you have to publish. If you don't want the public key to be the identifier, fine, you can change the ID, but the public key only needs to be published once. So I'm just trying to simplify it by saying, just use the public key as the identifier. And then the only thing you ever have to publish is the accumulator value. The only time it should ever change is when you revoke. When you're adding, you don't have to change it at all. That was part of the breakthrough we got with Allosaur. Because all the accumulators you had to publish anytime you added or removed. But with Allosaur, you only have to change, you only have to update it when you remove. Or revoke is the way to think about it. The revocation oh, manager, I, the revocation yeah. manager as a services, uh, uh, it have to you have to to have a, a endpoint. What I'm going to publish this endpoint. Good point. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we suggested a couple of things. So so this could be. Um, I'll, I'll just, I'll continue to use revocation manager for now, but, um, it, it could have the revocation manager URLs. Um, so this is the definition would be the ID, the key, I should say public key, just to be clear and the accumulator. And then the reverage entries are just the accumulator. So from the change from an on creds v1 is we're no longer listing no list of change status that's currently included in um when you when you publish a reverage entry you now you only publish the accumulator so that's a change um the these could be published in the credential status of the credential itself um, they could be put into the credential or yeah. they could be um, put into the reverage definition. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting point. Yeah. I forgot. It, it's, it would be valid to put that in the reverage def. And one more question about uh, is this uh, the, the crypto, all, all the crypto behind, behind all of our is compliance with NIST? And what is the, the link between? 
Okay. No, it's no, it's based on pairings. So okay. Um, I know NIST is aware of it. They've they've yeah. said pairings are great. Um, no no pairing based cryptography is quote unquote NIST approved. However, like um, NIST, well, lots of companies, even the government, are using non NIST approved stuff. So all all NIST means, like at least in the United States, is if it's not NIST approved, the NSA has to review it. That's all. Okay, thank you. The other thing is a lot of hardware vendors uh, only do NIST approved stuff, which is kind of annoying. So if you want hardware specific like HSMs or whatever, they won't do any of this uh, yet. So, but that doesn't mean it's not being used pretty heavily. Like pretty much a lot of the blockchains are using the BLS 12.3.1 curve and pairings. So like Ethereum is using it, Definity is using it, and and some other Solana, Polkadot. So, is it this political behind the decision of the NIST not to approve? The yeah, pairing? well, the kind of. There's it's somewhat political, but the other part is you can pay NIST to audit it and get it included, but it's very expensive, so no one does it. Okay. They just kind of wait for everybody to do it for free. <laughs> so. <laughs> Okay, so I'm not too I'm not too concerned about it right now. Um, more and more pairing based stuff just keeps coming out, and NIST is very open to it compared to they used to be like five years ago. So non creds v1 is using pairings, but it's on a weaker curve, and so um, more and more stuff just keeps getting coming out with this BLS 12 381 curve stuff. Like Zcash has been using it for years, so. I'm not terribly worried about it, but it does, but it can be a, a hindrance to adoption if NIST is required. Thank you. But NIST is rarely like must be required, right? So yeah. most people just say, I want NIST so I don't have to deal with kind of the audit hurdles and things like that. That's all. And um, if I remember correctly, not. things like BBS Plus is based on BLS 312, right? Yes, it is. Yeah. And so if you want to use BBS Plus, you've got the same hurdle. So, in fact, this is even simpler than BBS Plus. It's basically just BLS signatures in, in a slightly different way. There's almost no difference. You put BLS three twelve. I think you meant twelve three eighty one. <laughs> yeah, I just listened quickly. Twelve three eighty one. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, last topic I wanted to go over was um, complex JSON in and on creds. Mm -hmm. So um, ideas for the scheme object. So, oh, first question I had is I heard this rumor, Mike. Um, so one of the premises I've had is that certainly with BBS Plus, um, we don't have to know the number of attributes to be in a credential ahead of time, which means that um, things like um, uh, things like arrays become supportable in the credential. So you can have a, a verifiable credential that contains an array of say bank accounts and your um, that can be signed because it, uh, unlike in on credits one, in, in an on credits V1, you had to have, um, you had to, you had to know upfront exactly how many attributes you were gonna be signing and which which attributes you were going to be signing. Whereas in BBS plus, um, you can sign any number of them with the same, using the same public key. So the question is, or the same private key. Um, I was hearing the other day that the, the Poincheval Saunders key size changes based on the number of attributes to sign. Does the public that- key does, The public key does, yes. It does. So does that affect the ability to support arrays? No, you just have to know how many, like what's the maximum number of claims you want to be able to sign. Okay. So the private that, key is the private key is 
is the same but, size. So doesn't matter how many there are, but the public key does. Okay. The thing so is, when, you're, you're when, just when, trading. When, you're just trading computation for space with BBS Plus because BBS okay. Plus, you still have to know how many you're going to sign, but it just it can generate them on the fly, the values on the fly because they're not tied to the private key at all. Whereas in punchable sanders, they are tied to the private key, so you do have to know how many maximum you would like to be able to sign. This is yep. usually not a problem because you usually know how many you want. Right, but it depends whether, if you're publishing the public key as the credential, in the credential definition, in other words, you've got a one time for all your credentials, you've got to know up at, at the time you publish that, how many you're going to sign. So if BBS Plus, you don't have to make that decision at all, whereas in PS, you've got to make some sort of decision. That is correct. And okay. that was the discussion I had with Tobias you know, looker six yeah. years ago, why we ultimately said, Hey, let's try BBS plus first. So <laughs> okay. um, the downside to BBS plus is doing threshold signing with it is not very easy. It's very okay. complicated. Okay. With PS, it's very easy. Very, very easy. So that's the trade-off you have. So threshold signing with PS is very easy and the security proofs are much stronger than BBS plus, um, but BBS is a little more dynamic in the number of claims you can have. Say that again, that last one. Uh, so PS has stronger security proofs and threshold signing is much, much easier. And so the downside is this PS must know Maximum number of claims you're going to sign up front. Yep. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, it doesn't have to be the exact size, just the maximum. That's right. Yep. Okay. And you're going to trade off flexibility in what you're going to sign with, with the size of the key. Yeah. And like I said, most of the time, this isn't a problem because most yeah. people know how many you're going to sign up front anyway. So In practice, like I said, this isn't usually a problem. Yeah. Where okay. where it does happen is like like maybe you were alluding to is the um like medical or something like that, where there might be a dynamic number of entries, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Um, but you can always mix and match them, right? You could say for that one, we're going to choose BBS plus, but for others we're, where we already know what the max size is, we'll choose PS. Okay. So you can mix and match them. That's the, that's the great thing about non V2. Yeah. You pick whatever works for you. Oh, the other thing is PS uh, proofs. Uh, so ZKPs are smaller than BBS. Okay. So that's the other trade-off is PS ZKPs are smaller. So good stuff. This is very helpful. Sorry, let me capture. I just wanted to capture this as we go. Okay. So ZKPs are smaller and you can also parallelize the ZKPs, whereas in PS you cannot. So you can say they're smaller and they're faster to generate, whereas BBS Plus, you have to do them all in in serial, in series. I hear you, dog. Sorry. <laughs> Your dog We're must be like my dog, constantly We're at the door, running in and out, in and out, in and out. We're babysitting. <laughs> and he loves to come into my office and out again. Okay. Um, last part that I wanted to talk about was complex JSON and an on cred. So as I said, um, with an on creds V1, we had very, you know, list of attributes. That's it. No complex JSON supported. And so the schema was just a list of attributes in, in an on creds V2, obviously for those attributes, 
uh, for each attributes, we are going to have metadata about them, just to use a different word. <laughs> but we're going to have attributes about the attributes, um, which is what gives us our flexibility in an on-preds B2. We're going to say this is uh, an integer, this is a string, this is a set, um, this is a scalar, and, and so on. So we've got to, and, and, and not only that, we're going to say, here's the regular expression that the value must uh, achieve, or here's the... Um, uh, here's the range uh, the data must fit and, and things like that. So that's, um, we have to have a lot more information about the schema than we had in an on-credits V1. Um, so the question is, how do we manage that schema object um, in order to support complex JSON, in order to, to support structures and arrays? Because that's the that is the goal is that we, unlike an on creds v one with v two, we would like to be able to support any and uh, you know any credential, any w three c credential. So, um, so the ideas I had for doing these and and open to anyone's comments is um, we use JSON path, so we're back to a list of attributes. So JSON path lets you do I believe where did I have one yeah. So with JSON path, you basically say something like, here are my attributes, ID, alumni of, and so on. And these become just flattened. Uh, JSON path defines exactly what a flattened version of that is, what a flattened version of that string is. So we're back to the schema for the credential we're going to sign is just a flat list of attributes. Um, that those attributes are structured in a way that we that we retain that when we use them we uh, we retain the structure and we can support arrays and so on. But the bottom line is these are just um, uh, a flat list, so that's beneficial. Um, we do the same thing in V two if we want. <laughs> exactly that. So that's what I'm saying in V two. We can do that. Um, we get back to the same, the same as an on creds V1 in that they're all just flattened. And obviously this library shows the ability to do this. This is just some random thing I found on the internet, but just allows you to say, oh, here's the JSON I want to uh, pass in. Um, give me the, give me the structure. In fact, what we would probably do is just this. Um, believe that gets us to ah invalid json well i didn't quite get it right but you get you get my point is um oh i just need one more looks like yeah and we just get back to our simple list of those structures so uh, well supported libraries and and we get as we can take a a credential as an input and provide the list of values for it uh, as output. And then that becomes the, the place we get the schema from. Um, second idea I had was we use JSON LD, <laughs> uh, which is kind of interesting. So since a, a credential obviously has context, whoops, ah, shoot. Hey, Stephen, I got to drop anything else for me. Okay. Um, okay. Let's let's wrap this up. I'll, I'll just, we can combine the two. JSON-LD just, I don't think will work. And so I think in some way we're going to use JSON path. Um, if you've got to go, we can probably wrap it up now. Well, just any more questions on the. Uh, yeah. Yeah. On the no, I think we've covered the main topics. Um <laughs> I'll think more on this and and come back in the next week or two, depending on what. I think we'll probably move to biweekly meetings, and um, have those. So, okay. With and that, just I'll just wrap for, it up then. Well, and then for this group, just so you're aware, I'm working with the same people, same authors we did for uh, Alasor to make a post quantum equivalent. So, excellent. So there's yeah, already that's quantum exciting. equivalent for PS signatures, and then we're going to make a post-quantum equivalent for Allosaur. I'm so, really looking forward to hearing about that. We'll talk about that one in a future one. So 
Yeah, the same thing we talked about today, the revocation manager and revocation support or credential status support, but um, with post-quantum signatures. Fascinating. All right, folks, that's it for today. Thanks all. Thanks. Thank you. See ya.